Coming up next is Jeff Endress. <laughs> you know, I wonder when this all started if Jeff Endress, humble dairy farmer from Wanakee, had any froggy idea that you were going to be on so many panels, used as an example in so many different ways. He's uh, from Wanakee, Endress Berry Ridge Farms, chair of Yahara Pride Farms, the only chair I think Yahara Pride's ever had. And he is going to kind of share with you how, I'm sure from its infancy, a farmer-led watershed group has turned into kind of a, a leading uh, thought group for the state, helped to spawn a lot of those other watershed names that you saw across the state. So, Jeff, I'll turn the podium over to you again, my boy. <laughs> All right. I'm glad to be here. Pam, I uh, read over the weekend that... Uh, you're shutting down Pamble, Pamble Field. Pamble's done. And I couldn't help but think about Aaron Rodgers this morning because all the talk shows talk about Aaron Rodgers if he's staying, if he's going. He should have been out there this morning at 5:30 when I was checking on all the waters and all the things around the farm that needed to be done, and got a little used to the cold. Maybe he'd play a little better. So, over the Packer uh, disappointment, but on to the next thing. So I'm here today and, and hopefully um, it's been a good program so far, so hopefully it won't change. So you have Pride Farms, a farmer-led group here, started about 12 years ago, formally, um, created our own 501c3 nonprofit in 2012. It was kind of fitting to start another nonprofit since I was already farming. <laughs> So, but this one's a little different. Our vision, we want clear water, viable agriculture, open space to enjoy by all, and also the secure funds to engage more farmers. We felt that agriculture was in a much better position to lead this discussion than to be dictated to. Very early on in our program, I met a young lady from Dane County by the name of Heidi Johnson. Oh, I think she's here today. <laughs> so I got Heidi, Heidi involved in a cover crop, crop uh, uh, trial. And uh, she did pretty good. She ended up at the university ahead of the extension. But uh, the, it was very, it was very, it was a fun project. It was something that we, we did. We wanted to see how cover crops performed in the field, different planting dates, different types of cover crops. But it it's actually was part of the, was probably one of the best things we did because it was the foundation to our organization and cover crops was where everything kind of started in our region because of the amount of bare ground that's uh, out on the landscape after corn silage harvest in the fall. So the slide you're looking at here today shows our enrollment since uh, 2013, you know, of the different acres, the different phosphorus reduction per acre, the cost of the pro of payouts. And if you look into the right side, the total unfunded, the farmers are generally funding more of these practices than we are being compensated for. So they take it one step further. That's the beauty of agriculture. Low disturbance manure injection, something that we brought in shortly after we uh, formed the organization. Manure was a big issue in this watershed, still is, big issue in this state. How do we handle this manure? A lot of tillage was being done to bury manure early on. We were looking for a piece of equipment that could actually get manure in the ground to save the nitrogen and reduce the amount of runoff coming off the land. We found one on the, out in the middle of Iowa that was created by a farmer. Imagine that. It was created by a farmer. And when I talked to him on the phone, I said, how does this piece of equipment work? He explained it. And then I said, how much tillage did you do behind it? And he said, 
The only piece of till, the only tool that follows this machine is the corn planter. I was hooked. We brought it in. We brought it in to our watershed. We set up a tanker. We uh, uh, moved it throughout the watershed. That was that very first year down there in 2013. And that was the results. Look how the program has grown since then. Agriculture, the technology, we talked about it earlier today. These are the things that move the, the needle forward. Low disturbance, deep tillage. Again, starting with the combination of cover crops, inviting water in the ground versus running off the surfaces. One of the main reasons why farmers do tillage is they're worried about compaction. They're worried about that crop the next year. Well, this allows us to get a cover, get a cover crop out there, but not tear it out with tillage, a low disturbance deep tiller that actually loosens the ground below the surface, but does not disturb the top of the soil um, out in the field. Again, you can see the numbers. Strip tillage, we wanted to do something high tech. When you can work a strip of land, come back in and plant right in that strip with satellites and GPS and only disturb a fraction of the land versus all the land. It's growing. One of the things that we've noticed from early on from uh, Discovery Farm, manure, February and March, worst time of the year to have manure out there, right? Well, maybe we shouldn't put it out there then. But how can we not put it out there? You got to take care of the livestock, right? Well, maybe we got to go back to headland stacking. How does that work? What are the numbers? You can see we, we started this in 2016. You can see how the numbers have added up. It's got a pretty good outcome per acre, an average uh, reduction of phosphorus of about 1.2 pounds per acre from leaving the farm field. Composting, let's take that headland stack and let's take it one step further. What if we actually broke it down and, and mixed some air with it and used it uh, as a created compost. We're doing more of that, and we do a fair amount of that on our farm. Something new last year, deferred killing of alfalfa. What good does it do to promote cover crops if we're killing cover crops? Alfalfa, the regrowth of alfalfa after in the fall has a lot of phosphorus in it. If you break that, that if that is terminated in the fall, that, that plant breaks down over time, that phosphorus is, then becomes soluble and moves off with the snow. So we're talking to farmers about, hey, defer that. Obviously there's a cost involved. Why are farmers killing it off in the fall or terminating it in the fall? Much easier to plant into in the spring. One less thing to do in the spring, probably higher yields. We have the technology in, in herbicides right now that we don't necessarily have to do that. So we can put it out there and prolong the termination. Seeding grass with alfalfa. We're finding out with soil health how much value grass is to the soil. We also are finding out in agriculture and animal livestock right now that there's value in grass as a feed. We promoted alfalfa to no end in, uh, in the dairy industry to, pr to promote milk production. But we're finding in today's confinement facilities, we don't need good alfalfa to feed heifers or dry cows or calves, but grass will be sufficient. Grass can also be supplemented into the milk cow ration. So let's get these highly erodible fields back in some form of grass. Don't, get the, don't put the row crops on it. That's the thinking behind this. Here's our cost share enrollment, our cost share acres enrolled over, over year comparison. We got a steady growth. If you engage the farmers with purpose and reason, they will be involved. Cost share incentive payouts. You can see 
The farmers always generally do more than what the cost share is. Pretty good bang for your buck. If you're gonna invest in agriculture and, and maybe invest in, in water quality, maybe this is a good place to invest. Protect and improve surface waters. This is what it kind of amounts to. Our last year's results is we had a few 25 pounds less than 40,000 pounds of reduction by the programs that the farmers participated in. We had over 10,000 pounds both of cover crops and low disturbance manure injection. Throughout the entirety of our Pride's cost share program, look at the amount of phosphorus reduction that is done in the surface waters in this region. When you compile the numbers. Now many of these practices are not just phosphorus reduction practices, they're also nitrogen reduction practices. So we, we, we concentrate on phosphorus in this region, mainly because of the lakes and those types of things, but they also are two and three fold, even carbon. Look at, look at the carbon um, you know, numbers that are evolving out of this as well. How do we strike that balance between urban and agriculture? The gentleman before me was talking about philosophies and different things that, you know, where we need to align. Well, we don't have agriculture, we don't have the open space folks. So we better learn how to get along. A little bit about our farm. Andres Berry Ridge Farms, three equal partners, myself and my brother Steve and Randy, purebred Holsteins. We got a herd average of 31,000 pounds of milk and 1,300 pounds of butterfly. I've been farming 35 years. What do you think those numbers were when I started farming? Pam, you want to guess? About 17,000 pounds of milk. In 35 years, we've bought less cows on this planet, we produce more milk, and mainly because of technology university helping promote this industry in this state. We manage 1,500 acres of cropland and a various of, of crops here. Manure management, including composting. Uh, we're taking manure to the local digesters now. And we're also um, bringing it back in two different forms. One in the form of liquid and the other in fiber. With the solid, the solid uh, fiber we're bringing back, we're composting. I started this about six years ago. We're learning the ins and outs of composting. How are we composting now? Well, we compost inside the sheds and we do it outside as well. I want to, you can kind of see in this second picture, you know, I, got, I even got a bald eagle standing on my compost window one day. So that proved to me that I'm on the right track and must be environmentally friendly, right? Where can you compost? We do some, like I said, we do some under roof, we do some out in the field. What we have learned through your Hera Pride trials and the on-farm on trials is that when we stack manure out in the field and turn it on a regular basis, we virtually have no leaching in the soil. In fact, we did soil samples under the compost before and after we've created compost. We're actually finding lower numbers below the compost than we had in the field next door that was growing corn. So it's a practice that can be relatively inexpensive to manage or to build infrastructure for, but yet be uh, environmentally friendly. Again, where do we compost? We can compost out in the field. Cattle and stack it, like we, I said earlier there with the, the cattle and stacking manure versus uh, spreading it in February and March. We've done those trials with Yahara Pride, put that manure out there in February and March, came back in in April and May and June, started turning that, that uh, windrow, made beautiful compost. Types of manure. We've uh, used some freestall scrapings Bedding pack, manure, separated solids, all go into the recipe. Separated solids look like this. 
um, different loading types of manure, um, in, you know, to make the windrows, building the windrows, and actually turning and aerating the windrows. You can see the steam coming out from the compost turner there. We maintain a temperature on those windrows anywhere from 120 to 160 degrees, killing all the pathogens, killing everything that uh, would normally not be good in someone's well. Finished compost, we get a, about 40% shrink on the product. We're shrinking the product from what it, raw ingredients down 60% of what, you know, it normally would be. So less trips to the field. That's some of the trade-offs from going through the extra steps. Transporting and staging. That's something I spent my day doing yesterday. I was moving compost to the field and putting it on the field, on the headland, waiting for next spring to be spread. And again, spreading. Here we can, we've opened up an opportunity with, by using compost that we can actually um, spread on alfalfa in the growing season, where you normally wouldn't spread on alfalfa in the growing season because of pathogens, because of the, the uh, material you would be spreading would, uh, would uh, smother out the alfalfa crowns. Um, the other thing we're doing is we're stabilizing nitrogen. We're stabilizing phosphorus. Dr. Laura Ward Good did some work with me, and we found out that the, the phosphorus in the manure was mostly dissolved phosphorus in the, when it was, when started the composting process. When we were done, it was more particular. We figure it was, was uh, attaching to the carbon. Something we got to learn more about. We don't quite understand this all yet but it's showing promise and that's it.